Hey, uh, good morning again. I see you got some new faces here today. Why don't we take an extra minute and make sure you go say hi to someone you haven't met yet. share some announcements today, and uh, we'll go ahead and just do that as we get started. Uh, this Tuesday night, uh, Women's Prayer Online, literally hanging out in prayer. Uh, they're right now they're utilizing uh, Google Hangouts for uh, their weekly online prayer meeting, and so some of the ladies, I know it's hard to get out in the middle of the week and, and all that, but you can certainly participate online, so if you're interested in doing that this week, you can see Julie Durkin today, uh, or my wife, she's normally here, she's traveling uh, this weekend, she'll be back in town tomorrow. I'm sorry, I'm still with this thing. Uh, that's at 6 o'clock on Tuesday nights, uh, every Tuesday night. It's a prayer hangout for the ladies. And then uh, Wednesday, we're going to resume our uh, midweek uh, men's and women's groups. Uh, this Wednesday will be the men's group. And uh, for you guys who haven't come out before, uh, we meet at Panera right up the road here on Mallory's, uh, Mallory Road. And uh, it's uh, just a great time to kind of go over the Word of God together. If you'd like to come out a little early and get a bite to eat, we invite you to do that. Uh, you know, maybe quarter to six, six o'clock or something. There's usually a handful of us out there getting a little coffee or a, a bagel or a sandwich or something like that. So we just hang out a little bit as well. Um, coming up, our Good Friday service on Good Friday, obviously. That is April uh, 3rd. We'll be here at 5.30 in the evening, so uh, hopefully uh, if you are working that day, you'll be able to get off a little bit early and, and come on out and join us. Uh, this year is actually going to be really special. I'm excited about it. Uh, Mark Leventhal is going to lead our church in a Passover Seder, uh, and so we're going to all participate. It's, uh, this won't be like they'll be up here just showing you everything. We're going to have tables laid out, and we're all going to be able to kind of participate uh, as if we were in a home doing this. Uh, together, so it'll be a real treat. Uh, that said, there will be some, uh, uh, aside from us just all participating where we are, there's a couple of key roles along the way as well that involve things like reading and, and such that we're going to be looking to enlist a few people in. So uh, if you'd like to get involved in that, uh, this week in our weekly email, I'm going to include some more details about that, and I'm also going to try and make sure I remember to have a, a, a flyer in our bulletin next Sunday. Uh, where you can also uh, see some of that. And just let me know if you'd like to do that. Uh, my hope is that a lot of you will want to do it. We'll just have to pick and choose or something like that. But um, but it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, a really great thing. And of course, the, the Passover Seder, like so much that has come out of the Old Testament, really has a tremendous amount of symbolism about the person and work of Christ. And so we'll see that as we go through this. And uh, Mark and I started meeting on that to talk about some of that. And I'm just really excited at what he's already putting together. So... Um, uh, so uh, I hope you can make it out on Good Friday. And of course, our Resurrection Sunday service on April 5th will be here at 10 o'clock at our normal time. And I will be sharing, of course, about the Lord's resurrection and all the beautiful hope that that brings us uh, and, 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 and the accomplished work, not only on the cross, but also in leaving the grave empty. And uh, so uh, looking ahead beyond that, the Women's Conference is also coming up. That's April 10th and 11th. Janie Alfred will be our special guest. She's going to be speaking out of Proverbs 14.1, uh, A Wise Woman Builds Her Home. And uh, ladies, I really want to encourage you to come out to these things. We, uh, uh, we've had, some of you have been to some of the conferences we've done in the past, whether uh, women's conferences or we've done some men's things. We've also had a group conference last year. We did a prophecy conference, you might recall, with Don Stewart. Um, and uh, we're looking to continue to do these kinds of things because they give us an opportunity as a group of churches to come together and participate in something for all of our, our people to be able to come and enjoy. Uh, and, and really, these are a blessing. They're a great chance to get together for fellowship, hear some wonderful teaching, worship together, uh, and build some great relationships as we, uh, as we you know, learn to walk with the Lord together. So uh, the cost in that is going to be 45 bucks. It covers the food and, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. It's going to be really nearby right here. It's, uh, it's actually at the... Um, 
uh, oh, it escapes me right now. It's at the um, Hilton. Uh, the Hilton Garden, the Hilton Garden right here on uh, in Cool Springs. So again, that's going to be on April 10th and 11th. So please mark your calendars, ladies, for that and come on out. Uh, our group trip to Antigua uh, has been scheduled for July 9th through the 18th, but we are thinking of bumping it up a couple of days. Uh, so any of you who have shown interest in going, let me know if that works for you. I'll put that in the email this week as well, but we're thinking of moving it up two days so that instead of the 9th to the 18th, it'll be the 7th to the 16th, uh, in part because uh, one of our folks going along has got another family thing going on on the 18th, and so we're trying to accommodate all that. If that creates a problem, we can keep the dates the same, but if it looks like it'll work for everybody, uh, then we'll bump those uh, that date by two days. So uh, we can talk about that. Please let me know that. Uh, and of course, uh, as we always like to mention, you can check out our website for any other uh, goings on here at the church. We encourage you to do that. Um, uh, one other announcement I guess I'm just thinking of off the top of my head here. Uh, some of you may have grabbed one of the uh, butterscotch creamers for your coffee and thought it was a regular, just so you know they're out there. Some of you like that stuff, some of you really don't. So I want to give you a fair warning on that so you get your coffee and think, what on earth did I just do? But, um, so anyway, okay. Well, this morning we're going to be turning to Luke 16. Does anybody need a Bible? If you do, just raise your hand. We'll be glad to give you one. Uh, this will be our gift to you. Uh, you're always welcome to keep the Bible if you don't have one already. Okay, everybody's packing. We're good to go. Again, Luke chapter 16. We're making our way through Luke's gospel. And, uh, and we find ourselves today in chapter 16. And we are going to go through the chapter... And I was reading, as I was reading through the passage, uh, so much of what Jesus speaks about here deals specifically with the subject of money and ultimately what it, the impact it has on us personally, our approach uh, to where our kingdom really is. And so I've called this message today, and I don't, I don't normally announce a title on a, on a Sunday. We put them on there because, I don't know, people like titles. And so, um, but uh, I've decided to call this Reckoning Accounts. Uh, and it has a lot to do, this passage, with really, again, where our kingdoms really lie and what Jesus might have to say about this. In chapter 15, it was kind of a revelation of <coughs> what it is that God values. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we've been in Luke's Gospel, so coming back around, uh, chapter 15, again, was, was, was something of a revelation of what it is that God values. And, and really, it was kind of breathtaking to realize that God loves a sinful man so much so that he will actually seek him out. Uh, there were three parables that Jesus told, and we went through them, and one of them dealt with a father, the, the father of the prodigal son, who had made his son, was such a father that his son always knew he could come home, even though he came home thinking, really, I'm only worthy to be a slave and not even be counted as a son. It was, it was beautiful to imagine, and of course, culturally, this was mind-blowing to, for Jesus to tell a story where a father, when a prodigal son returned, actually running off to greet him and to restore him immediately without making him jump through any hoops, but to immediately restore him. Uh, the other two parables prior to that, when Jesus talked about uh, something of value being searched for, and it's very telling about the heart of God in terms of what he values. He values you and I, and that's why I say it's breathtaking. When you think about your sin, and, and I never encourage people to, to try and move forward in life by, by looking in the rearview mirror. But every now and then, it's a good idea to take stock of where it is that you and I came from. What is it that we were saved from? Because I think that it gives us a refreshed and renewed perspective on just how amazing God's grace truly is. And so chapter 15 gives us some insight into that. And it, again, reveals to us something about what God values. Now... Chapter 16 is more of a warning against what man values. It stands in stark contrast. Uh, in chapter 15, when, when, when God, who is pictured in these, in these parables, uh, seeks after and looks for or runs out to embrace the prodigal, uh, it reveals to us that God's heart is for the person. He cares about the person that he's going after. That, that's what's of value to him. But in chapter 16, we see that Jesus puts his finger on something that honestly is all too familiar with us, what man values. Uh, and that is oftentimes personified best in money. But it's not only money, but it's what money buys. It's what money affords us. It's the kind of things that accompany uh, having financial wealth. Oftentimes it's power, it's recognition, it's building a kingdom of our own. 
here on the earth. And Jesus speaks to this here in chapter 16 and uh, really in what we'll, we'll break down into three different sections. And we'll start by reading verses 1 through 13 to get us going this morning. So Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1, where it says, He also said to his disciples, Jesus then is, says also to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. Interestingly, that word wasting is the same word that is translated squandered by the prodigal son. And so the steward is squandering or wasting or putting to no good use uh, this man's goods. Verse 2, so he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. And then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and said to him, said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And so he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by an unrighteous mammon, that when you fall, uh, they may receive you in an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in uh, what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And Father, as we spend time in the word this morning, in your word, we pray that you would guide us and help us to understand these things. Not just so that our minds might be filled with knowledge, as important as that might be, but that our hearts might be set ablaze with a passion and desire to have a proper perspective, to have a right understanding of where your relationship fits into the overall scope of our lives and help us not to compartmentalize different areas, separating secular from sacred, but rather help us to see in these things instruction on how we might blend all these things for your glory. Thank you, Father. Be with us as we just continue now. In Jesus' name, amen. Greed and money, building one's own kingdom, and unfortunately, all too often the indifference toward man and God that often follows these things. This is what Jesus is speaking to in this passage uh, this morning. Now, I like to use the word investment, uh, not typically in regard to money, because you have to have money to invest it, but, but I like the word investment itself because it speaks of something particular. Uh, and of course, in terms of money, the idea of investing money uh, speaks of pouring money into something with the intent of getting a return, simply put. And this is uh, the way our system works. But it's not only true in money. It also, if this word finds a place uh, in really any area of, area of our lives in which we pour ourselves into something with the intent of getting a return. Of course, the question that is raised, who are we seeking a return for? What kind of investment are we making into what kind of an arena and what kind of a return are we ultimately looking uh, to, to, to make? And so while we think of it, again, oftentimes in terms of money and finance and that kind of a thing, the truth is on a much deeper level, we need to consider, I would say we must consider into what we do invest our hearts because the dividend of that choice not only has impact in time, but ultimately in eternity. And again, we'll see these things as we go through. But we begin here again by looking at this parable that's been known as the parable of the unjust steward. Um, a steward is a manager, one who's in charge of someone else's resources, somebody who's been given authority to handle someone else's affairs, whether financial, household, etc. Uh, that was this man's job. That was his role. He was not the owner of these things. He was not the master of the house. He was the steward. He was given charge over these things, much like Joseph in the Old Testament. You remember under Pharaoh's uh, house, uh, or Potiphar's house, I should say, he was uh, given charge over the house. He was basically numero uno in that place, and so he was able to 
to, to give direction to the other servants. He was able to order and to buy and sell in, in Potiphar's name. He had authority as a steward over the house. Well, that's what this guy's job was. And so the problem was is that he began to act as though he was the owner of the house, and he began to treat those resources as though they were his own, without thinking of the fact that they really belonged to somebody else, and he was ultimately going to be held accountable for these things. That was this man's problem. Now, the truth of the matter is that it did, right as soon as the story starts, Jesus lets on that this guy was found out. He was found out. Now, there are a number of principles that we are going to learn from this story, and so I'm going to kind of go through them as we make our way through. But the first one is this, is that we will be held accountable for what we do with our lives. That's a very simple principle that is laid out right away. The steward took hold of these things that were not his, but he was given charge over, squandered them, and was ultimately called to account on them. Don't you know that you and I, in a very similar kind of a way, have the same kind of accountability coming? You see, God has given each one of us, uh, whether it's finances or abilities or skills or, or whatever, you know, talents. I, I hesitate to use that word because we cross that over into the word talents in the parable of the talents that Jesus told. It was speaking literally of a, a measure of money there, but there is a parallel there nonetheless. God has given us resource of one kind or another that he ultimately has given to us not to treat as if they were our own, but to ultimately invest and handle as though they were someone else's, which in fact they are. Now, uh, I've mentioned in the past that my old pastor, uh, Phil, in uh, Elk Grove in Chicago, uh, the church that Julie and I came out of, um, he was, it was and is a phenomenal teacher. He is an excellent expositor of the word. However, he always struggled with the idea of public speaking. Uh, I don't know if you probably are aware of this, but you know, public speaking has often been seen on lists of the greatest fears that people have as being at the top of the list. As a matter of fact, one list, if I remember correctly, public speaking was number one and death was number two. <laughs> Which is one comedian put it. It's like saying that when you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in the coffin than, than give the eulogy. <laughs> you know, but, but Phil has, has this, uh, and he's gotten over it over the years, but he, he had this fear of public speaking. Uh, but he always had a lot of food to put on the plate. Now, I have, since, there was a time when I was younger that I was a little nervous about being in front of people, but for the longest time, I've never really had a fear of being in front of people. My fear is having nothing to say. And so, but I can say it all day. So, what God has given me is a desire in my heart to teach his word. And he's also given me an ability to speak in front of people. Uh, and, and with all seriousness, regardless of the size of the crowd, I'm comfortable in front of people being in this place. If I were to, to, to use that sense of comfort, spend, standing in front of people simply for my own gain, if I went out and started doing just, you know, powers of positive thinking seminars or some kind of a thing and just used, kind of tried to work on some charisma and just kind of, you know, wow audiences for my own benefit, that would be squandering what God had given me as a resource that ultimately is intended to be invested in his kingdom. See what I'm saying? If I do this, because I enjoy it and because I know I have a calling, but ultimately it's my way of pouring back into God's kingdom what he has given me to work with. And he's given me precious little outside of this to work with, and so I know what I need to be doing. And so to not do it, for me, would be sin. It would be to waste and squander what God has given me to use. And we all have something like this. For some of you, it might be the same kind of a thing, where you feel like you can speak in front of people. For other people, uh, it might be God's blessed you financially, and so you, you, you have these resources to pour into his kingdom. Maybe you have an ability to evangelize, but you just, you know, you have a choice of whether you're going to do it to garner friends to yourself or whether to reach people for the kingdom of God. How you use those resources that he gives you is up to you, but remember as you make that choice, these are resources that God has given us. They're not really our goods, they're his. And how we invest them is important. And we will be called to account for these things. As a matter of fact, there is, uh, there is mention by Paul of the judgment seat, the beam of seat of Christ, in front of which we all will stand. For believers, it's not a question of whether or not we go to heaven or hell, but there is a point at that point where God will judge the works that we have done. And those things that were done for his glory will stand like gold. But those things that were not done for his glory will burn away like wood, hay, and stubble. So there is an accounting that comes to bear 
over those resources that God has given us as stewards over that. Hebrews 4.13 says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. An account will be given. This is a definitive statement. And it's made to this unjust steward that his time is up, and it's time now to give an account of what he has done. Um, notice in this particular case, uh, and throughout really this parable and the rest of what Jesus is saying, he is saying to this to his disciples. We know here that he's, he's sort of turned his attention from the Pharisees to the disciples, and he's speaking to them in particular. But we'll also notice as we get through this section into verse 14 that the, that the Pharisees are listening. They can hear what's going on. And so there is a context into, into which these words are being spoken. And ultimately, the target audience for these things is not only the disciples, but the question of stewardship extends also to the Pharisees and the scribes, those who have been given stewardship over the house of God in Israel. And so it is not an accident that they are hearing these things, because they too will be held accountable for the way that they're handling the stewardship that God has given them. But notice here, the unjust steward, like the prodigal son, apparently did not realize how good he had it. He was in the master's house, he was charged with uh, covering all the goods, but he squandered these things. Much like the prodigal son, who, uh, who had access to his father's house and everything, but wanted to get off on his own and take these resources and everything. Well, here, here this guy's a steward of the house, and he's, take, he's abusing these things, he's misusing them as if they were his own, when in fact they belong to someone else. And ultimately now he's called into account and he's got to do something. And he realizes here, as we read here in verse 3, he doesn't know what to do right away because he doesn't dig. He's afraid to be, he's ashamed to beg. He's too proud to go out there like the common folks. He's been living it up pretty well this far. But now it's about to come to an end. And so notice his solution. He shrewdly uses what remained of his position to call those people that owed his master a debt. Notice again, how much do you owe my master? He knows whose stuff this is. He calls them in. And in essence, he robs his master in order to save his own skin. This is not a simple act of kindness, and it's not really his place to do what he's doing, but he's trying to ingratiate himself to those who owe his master a debt so that when he is finally kicked out, he knows he's losing his job, so when he's out on the street, he'll be able to call in a favor. I'm from, again, I'm from Chicago. The idea of calling in favors in politics is common. <laughs> Probably is here too. I guess politics is politics anywhere. Uh, but we all know what's happening in Chicago. I might think it's not happening here, but whatever the case, this guy's going to call in some favors. And so he's ingratiating himself to their to their uh, you know to these debtors. Now, <coughs> what makes this parable difficult is the way Jesus commands. The unjust steward. That trips us up. Uh, if it didn't trip you up a little bit, then maybe you weren't listening when I was reading it. This guy has been squandering his master's goods, and now he's basically taken money that should have been owed his master, and he's basically told them to write it off so that he can have a good place to sit after he's kicked out of his job. Everything about what this guy's doing is wrong. And Jesus says, this guy did something right. That's right, that makes us scratch our heads a little bit. What exactly is Jesus commending in here? Because it doesn't seem as though we should be commending the behavior of somebody like this who is on the one hand squandering and on the other hand stealing. So what is it that Jesus is pointing out here? It's actually not as complicated as we might think, but this may not be as clear immediately. But there's a few key elements that I'll bring out that help us understand what Jesus is trying to teach. Because truly, he's trying to teach by way of contrast He's not pointing at this man and his character, or even his behavior necessarily, as much as it is the mindset that he's bringing to bear on his circumstances. Because again, first off, the parable immediately pricks our sense of right and wrong, right? I mean, Jesus calls this man in verse 8 an unjust steward. So we know he's clear. There's no ambiguity about where this guy is coming from. He's dirty. He's unjust. He's doing things that are not proper. He squanders the master's resources. He ultimately steals from him. As often is the case in Jesus' teachings, the parable, parables also, as I mentioned, intended to teach by way of contrast. Notice again the expressions he uses. The sons of this world versus the sons of light. There's a contrast being built here. And so he's not muddying the lines. He's actually keeping it quite clear. 
but there's only one point in particular that he is ultimately commending. And again, it's not the actions that he took per se, but it is the mindset rather that he took on. Not the actions that he took, but the mindset that he took on. Of course it was wrong to squander someone else's goods, and of course it was wrong to basically steal from the man in order to ultimately uh, make his own uh, way once he was kicked out of his job. So it's not his dishonesty that he's commending, but ultimately Jesus commends his understanding of his circumstances, the knowledge that his time was limited, and therefore single-mindedness in terms of what he could do to ultimately preserve himself through it. In other words, he was shrewd in that he recognized the that something needed to be done in the midst of the circumstances he found himself in. How he got himself there is not what's being commended. But the fact is, once he found himself in a circumstance, he very wisely or shrewdly went ahead to make sure that he did something about it to get through it. And for that, Jesus says, the sons of this world seem to be more equipped to handle themselves in tight circumstances than the children of light do. What does that all mean? It's as if to say this, the children of this world, in contrast to the children of light, unbelievers, believers. The difference with believers versus unbelievers in this parable, what's being portrayed, is that unbelievers seem to have a sense of urgency and understanding when the chips are down and they do something about it. They recognize the circumstances they're in and they act. He's not asleep in the midst of what's about to happen to him, and so he acts. The church, on the other hand, or believers in general, in this particular case, oftentimes just the, you know, the Jews themselves, the Israelites who believe in the God of Israel, but certainly we can bring extension here to the church today. The problem is oftentimes that the church finds itself often in a lulled sense of sleep when everything is going on around it and does not act, does not recognize the circumstances going on around it, and therefore sends urgency to invest in what's going on with the resources that have been given them. This man dishonestly took what he was given charge over and used it for his own good. How much more should the children of light use what God has given us when we know there's an eternity at stake, when we know what's going to be going on in the world around us, when Jesus, in fact, has told us what the world will look like before his return? Should that not wake us up and spur us to be all the more driven and directly focused into what it is that God is calling us to do right now? In essence, wake up out of our sleep and take a look around. If we're not motivated to use what God has given us to do something with it, then we are not recognizing the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And Jesus even goes on to say, and again, he's not, he's not intending to portray, I don't believe he's intending to portray the idea that we should look forward to using dirty money, as it might be seen here, because money in and of itself is not dirty. Remember, the Bible never says that money is the root of all evil. It says what? The love of money is the root of evil. Money is amoral. It is non-moral. It is a thing. It is a resource. It is a tool. It can be a trip up to somebody, but one man's trip up is another man's investment. Jesus says, make sure to use these things with an eternal mindset, with a kingdom mindset at play. Because in doing so, you are storing up for yourself a welcome reception in heaven. Be wise in the resources that God has given you. Time is short, and what we do with these things that God has given us, whether it's time, talent, or treasure, matter in time and eternity. We cannot see eternity. We find ourselves confined in time and space. Therefore, use it in what you see. Put it to work for the kingdom of God. I remember having a conversation with uh, uh, my, my boss happened, you know, I, I, I put on my social media sites, you know, what do you, you know, what do you do for a living? I said, I work for a Jewish carpenter. Mm -hmm. You know that. Get it? Jesus. Okay. Um, well, I actually worked for a, a Jewish family in Chicago, the place I worked for. And so we would have conversations about the Lord and the Bible and stuff like that. It was really, it was a lot of fun and all this kind of thing. But uh, they always used to tell me the joke, you know, well, Jesus saves, but Moses invests. <laughs> I used to get a kick out of that. So, um, but you know, the truth of the matter is, what Moses invested in is what we're talking about here. Moses did not amass for himself riches and wealth for himself. Moses invested himself in the people of God, and ultimately was looking uh, much like Abraham to a city whose builder and maker was God. He's somebody who did not necessarily have himself. Uh, 
so earthly minded that he was no heavenly good, if you let me borrow the expression. The idea was that he poured himself into that which God had called him to, that it would reap eternal benefits. And that is exactly what we're talking about. And I believe that is what is at the heart of what Jesus is saying in this parable. He says, look, look at how quickly those in the world who do not have spiritual sense will invest what they have when needed. We ought to take a, a page from that playbook and do such ourselves. And don't be afraid to use the money of the world to do it. I remember Moody, as a matter of fact, one time, uh, somebody criticized him because uh, they saw him take money from a drunk. Not take it, but it was given by a drunk to him. And someone said, why would you take the devil's money like that? And Moody said, well, the devil's had it long enough. Time for us to put it to good use. You know? I agree with that. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, money's not dirty. And I'm not even going to say you should necessarily go out and play the lottery so that you can win money to give to church. I would say don't do that. But, um, but money is, is what it is. You know, and Jesus is speaking about money. Put it to work. Let it do kingdom good. Let it be used for the kingdom of God. You know, and so anyway, be wise about the time we live in and invest the resources that we have been given that we might ultimately honor the Lord with them and have kingdom mindset in mind. Now, Jesus goes on here in verse 10, going back to this parable. He says, he is faithful in what is, is, is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. That's a principle. It's faithfulness and unfaithfulness in principle. Now notice here something too. Money is what Jesus is referring to as being that which is least. Okay? We'll see it here in, in verse 15 where Jesus speaks about that which is held in highest esteem by men as an abomination to God. Jesus sees money as a little thing. Uh, years ago, there was a, a uh, televangelist, you know, a TV preacher, um, I'll, I'll leave his name out because some of you may have heard of Benny Hinn. But <laughs> he used to always constantly go on about the idea of, you know, I want to rule now and riches. And there's always the prosperity gospel being preached in these circles. And, and, uh, and one of the great quotes, and I, I won't even pretend to imitate him, but it was just, you know, I, I don't want streets of gold, I want gold now, you know, this kind of a thing. And, but, but, but notice this. Yes, it talks about heaven being paved with streets of gold. Which is to say that in heaven, gold is so little of value as it's used as asphalt. Okay? Gold means nothing there. They walk on it. They move up and down the boulevard on it. It's, it's nothing. Here it is of incredible value to us. But it is of little consequence or value to God. How it is used, on the other hand, is of value to God. And therefore, if you've been given a little and you're unfaithful in that, there should be no expectation for God to give more to one who is not faithful in a little bit. But one who is faithful with the resources he's been given, much more will be given. Why? Because you can expect that one to be faithful. We know the parable Jesus told, the, the, uh, you kind of referenced it already, but the parable he told about the men that were given the talents by their master. Again, three stewards. Okay? One is given five talents, one is given uh, two talents, one is given one talent. The one with the five and the one with the two, they went ahead and doubled their money, 100% return on their investment. The third took the one talent, buried it in the ground, and did nothing with it. And when the master returned and questioned them on it, again, they were brought to account for how they had used the resources given them that they had been given charge over. He looked at the first two and said, well done. You have been faithful in a few things, therefore I will make you rule over many. Okay, you've been given more. The one with the 1,000, like the others, knew the character and expectation of the master that they were serving. And when he said, I knew that you were a shrewd man and that you're a hard man, and therefore I buried this in the sand so as not to lose anything. And the master said, well, if you knew this about me, then you knew my expectation was that I gave it to you to use it, not to bury it in the sand. Therefore, what little you have is going to be taken from you. And they gave it to the guy who had been given the most because he did, got the best return on it. And he ultimately was able to, to do that. Why? Because he was faithful. Because if he's faithful in a little bit, he'll be faithful in more. But if he's not faithful in a little bit, then he will not be given more. I want to be counted among those who are faithful with that little bit, that God feels he can trust me with more. That's the mindset Jesus is telling us to adopt. The idea of faithfulness with what God 
has given us. And so he puts this in connection with this whole idea of stewardship. And then he goes on to continue the thought. Therefore, if you have not been faithful and unrighteous mammon, who will uh, commit to you uh, to your trust true riches? Again, mammon being equated with the idea of it being, uh, you know, uh, and some, some have seen this, by the way, that, that money is inherently evil. But again, the scripture says elsewhere, uh, it says a lot of good can be done with money. So I don't want to read into that. But he says, if you can't simply be entrusted with the world's goods and money and this kind of a thing, why would you be entrusted with true riches? Those things that God sees value in. So be faithful. And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The two masters that Jesus is speaking about in particular here are the God's money or the Lord. Now, at this time, mammon simply referred to money. Okay, there was a time in the Middle Ages when there was a, a view that there was a demon of money called mammon and this kind of thing. But in this particular time in history, that wasn't <clears throat> likely the case. He's simply speaking about money. Because it doesn't have to be a demonic god that he's talking about. Money in itself is sufficient to be an idol in the eyes of the world. But you cannot serve that and serve God at the same time. It's impossible. You cannot serve two masters. He doesn't say you have to choose to love one or hate the other. He says you will love one and hate the other. Okay, And that, where your affections truly lie, will be borne out in where uh, your loyalties lie. Joshua in chapter 24, verse 15. We all know this passage. Some of us have it on our door knockers on our house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What preceded that statement was Joshua's call to God's people to decide to choose this day whom they will serve, whether the gods of the nations or whether the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, so a decision has to be made. Notice not, no, don't choose if you will serve somebody, choose who you will serve. Choose now who it is you will serve. Make this a definitive line in the sand for you, where you say, no, my devotion, my loyalty, my affinity, my affections, my heart belongs to the Lord, and not something else. That's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about loving one and hating the other. When Jesus called people to come follow him, and unless you hate your mother and father and such, he's not literally saying in that case you should, you should despise your parents. He's talking about a love that is so fervent and so single-minded that anything short of that could easily be seen as something of having no affection for whatsoever because your affection for the Lord is so strong. That's what he's talking about. And by the way, and I mentioned this before, but if your love for the Lord is that fervent, your love for others around you will also only be helped by that and not hurt. But your affection for the things of this world, the idols that can consume your thoughts and such, will fall to the wayside. And that's what Jesus is trying to project here. Make an under, make it a, take a clear understanding. You cannot blend these two and have split devotions over this. When you, I, when you say, I do to Jesus, just like in a marriage, you are saying, I don't, by definition, to everything else, right? When you stood at the altar and you said to your wife, I take you for better or worse, or you know, do you take for better or worse, for richer or for poor, for sickness and health, and you say, I do, that means that by definition, you have said, I don't, to this kind of a relationship with anybody else. And that's what Jesus is asking of us. To be so single-minded in our commitment to him, that literally, any idol that would dare to get on the throne of our hearts becomes an object of hatred. Not lust, not love, not desire, of hatred. This does not belong. And that, by the way, is why Jesus says, the things that are highly esteemed by men are an abomination to God. An abomination. Not just, hey, the things that are so important to men are a little consequence to God. No. The things that are highly esteemed by men are an abomination to God. Why? Because they become an idol. Because they get in the way. Because they take up space and residence on the throne of our hearts, which is a place that only God deserves. That's why God sees it as an abomination. That's not a, an uncarefully chosen word. That is a precisely chosen word because that is precisely what the problem is. And so the stewardship that we bring to bear has to be rooted ultimately in a decision that we will ultimately love God and not something else that can become an idol to us. And of course, this was the problem with the Pharisees, and we'll see that here 
in just a moment. But this thought before we move on. It was, it was Thoreau that said that a man is wealthy or is rich in proportion to that which he can afford to do without. Okay? A man is truly rich in proportion to how he can to what he can do without, not what he has, but what he can ultimately do without. Okay? Hold on loosely to the things of this world. They are simply resources to be used. They are not the foundation for your kingdom and mine. They're passing away. I remember again having a conversation in that same workplace with somebody else, and somewhere in one of our conversations, they said, Well, you can't take it with you. And she said, Yes, I can. I mean, really, she, she was thinking that whatever she amassed in this life, somehow she was going to, you know, like the pharaohs of old or something, they were going to just bury, bury this thing with it and they'll have it in the next life. No, that's not how it works. You can take nothing with you. Naked you came into this world, naked you will leave it. In other words, you know, only one life will soon, soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on up ahead. Now, of course, as we move into verse 14, we see again where the direction of these uh, parables ultimately first found their mark, or were intended to find their mark. Verse 14, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard these things, and they derided him, and they turned up their noses at him. They uh, very, very definitively just did not want to hear what Jesus had to say. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, and since that time the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one little one, uh, one tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, the things that Jesus says here might seem a little bit out of place, but I'm not, I'm not sure they really are. Uh, speaking of divorce in terms of stewardship and things like that, people have wrestled with how that fits into this context of what he's talking about. And, and I'm, I'll throw my own two cents into this here as we go through it. But, uh, but notice he says here, you are those who justify yourselves before men. That really was the problem, wasn't it? They weren't seeking to justify themselves before the Lord or to stand before the Lord in a way that was just. Rather, they wanted to be seen a certain way in front of the people. In other words, they sought position and prestige. And even as Luke records, as, an, as a parenthetical, they loved money. And therefore, they loved the finances, they loved the power, they loved the prestige. As Jesus would rebuke them for, they loved to be viewed a certain way by people, as being other and separate and ultimately above. Other and separate in itself would not be a bad thing. Remember, Jesus calls us to be different and holy and sanctified, different from the world, but to hold ourselves above the people around us. Now that's a problem, but that's what they sought after. They were arrogant. They were prideful. They wanted to be viewed in a way that just set them apart in a very arrogant kind of a way. And Jesus is very, as he often did, clearly calling them on it, so there's no ambiguity about what he's saying. And he, he puts his finger on the problem, uh, the heart of the problem. What is highly esteemed among men, or in other words, by you, is an abomination in the sight of God. In other words, that which you are holding on to as most valuable in your life is actually at the heart of the reason why you are so wrong in your relationship with God and your inability to share it properly with the people. You have a love for something that God sees as an abomination. Okay, this is not a general statement. This is a specific arrow to the heart that Jesus is firing. They didn't want to hear it. Now it goes on. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Now, the law and the prophets were until who? John, John the Baptist. This is a great trivia question, by the way. If somebody ever asks, well, who is the last of the Old Testament prophets? There's your answer. The law of the prophets were until John. The last Old Testament prophet makes an appearance in the New Testament. Um, but the law of the prophets were specific. He's, he's speaking here of that which was ultimately the sum total of what had been given to Israel by God for direction in terms of their knowledge of God, their walking with God, their civil relationships, and, 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 and how all these things fit into their their life with God. All of these things ultimately culminated in John. Why? 
because John was the forerunner of the Messiah. He was the one who very specifically called Jesus the Lamb of God. Okay, the prophets all, in one way or another, pointed like signposts toward this coming Messiah. The Lamb of God was a very specific term, a very legal term in their minds as well. Not only religious and ceremonial, but even legal in terms of sin and how that is dealt with. This Lamb would be given and offered uh, for the, in the stead of the people for their sin and to cover sin uh, as it were. And year after year they would offer these sacrifices and such. So this is a very specific thing. Jesus says these things all were up until John. And now since that time, the kingdom has come and people are pressing into it. Of course, John preached about the kingdom of God. Jesus himself in his ministry is preaching of the kingdom of God. And people are coming into it in strong contrast to nobody pressing in to the religion that the Pharisees and the scribes were promoting. <clears throat> the Jewish faith was intended to do two things. To be a lightning rod for people to come to know the true God and also, as Paul would say in Galatians, to point out the fact that our sin is an impossible problem that we have no capacity to deal with. Okay, the law was a schoolmaster to point us to Christ. It was supposed to keep us in the line so that we could clearly see that Jesus is the one that we need. He's the, he's the answer to our problem, like Job. If there was only one who could lay a hand on us both, well, Jesus is the answer to that prayer. This was the purpose of the law. The prophets bolstered that by, by giving the law, by pointing to the law, by pointing to the one that the law was pointing us to. And ultimately it ends with John. Why? Because now the kingdom has come. The master of the house has come to call into account the stewards over his house. And they want nothing to do with him. Now as he speaks about the law and the prophets, to those who are the stewards of the law, and the prophets, those who teach it, those who convey it to the people, is letting them know that the kingdom of God is actually being swarmed by people who are hungry to come into it. I think that's a very simple, I think it's intended to be a very simple statement. The kingdom of God has now come and people are pressing into it. At the same time, verse 17 reminds us that it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Elsewhere, Jesus would speak about one jot or one tittle of the law, which basically is like our saying a you know, period or a comma or a, any little accent in the language. There's no part of it that will pass away. And Jesus himself said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He didn't come to destroy or set it aside like it was some useless thing. No, he was the fulfillment of it. The law has its purpose, and ultimately that purpose found its fulfillment and culmination in the person and work of Christ. However, the Pharisees and the scribes are still wrapped up in this world of trying to put this forth because they will not receive Jesus as Messiah. So he's putting together for them an understanding of how they work together. They, however, are blind, and they're blind because of their desire for money and power and prestige. Now, with that in mind, he also then adds to it the idea that whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, in the midst of all this teaching on money and stewardship, Jesus points uh, not only to the Pharisees' love of money, but he also points to something that has been a point of contention for them along his ministry. Uh, he had been asked by them about divorce and questions like this, and he has spoken on it previously as well in his ministry already, but he adds it here, interestingly. Now, there were at least two schools, but we'll just point to the two most well-known schools of thought in regard to divorce in their time. And we'll bring this around. One was very conservative. You cannot divorce your wife for any reason outside of adultery. The other was very liberal. Uh, if your wife made dinner and it turned out to be a burnt offering, you could divorce her. If you found somebody better looking, you could divorce her because she was no longer pleasing to you. So there were a very conservative school, very liberal school. And of course, Jesus spoke to the issue. He said there's really only these set reasons. You know, God's desire has always been for man to leave his mother and father, to cling to his wife, and for the two to become one. Let no one uh, tear asunder that which God has brought together. And he made these things clear. However, in their minds, there were these schools of thought that were in tension together. Here's my two cents on why Jesus includes <coughs> this question of divorce in a question about money. And I don't know this, so this is not doctrine or theology, and uh, don't run with all Christ, God's a new crazy idea. It's not a revelation from God. But I can't help but wondering if part of the reason for this 
is because some of the liberal mindset about divorce may have in fact been due to the fact that someone was paid to have that mindset. In other words, if I give you some money, will you allow me to get divorced? Uh, this is not uncommon in religious circles. It wasn't uncommon in, in the religion I was brought up in. It was not uncommon in their day. I don't know if that's true or not, but for all the different reasons why people try to figure out why this particular passage fits in here, I find that to be as good a reason as any. Um, Jesus is making sure they understand the law of God is firm. It does not change because of your affections being elsewhere. As a matter of fact, the word of God will stand whether or not the stewards of it are faithful to it or not. The word of God endures forever. Okay? So Jesus is, is calling them out because of their distorted affections and the, where their desires truly lie. Their love for God has been superseded by a greater love for money. And it may very well have affected their theology. And so Jesus calls them out on it. Now in this last parable in chapter 16, he goes on to speak of the rich man and Lazarus. And I say parable a little bit slowly because I'm not entirely sure it actually is a parable as much as it is an actual account. The reason I say this is because this, if it is a parable, it is the only parable that Jesus actually names one of the individuals in it. And so I think there's something different here. I think this may in fact have been something that Jesus, as God knows, of an event that has taken place, and he's sharing the details of it, from which we will glean quite a bit. Verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day, which is to say he lived, uh, you know, really in, in, in great wealth and, and such every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Can you think of a more pathetic circumstance for someone to be in? And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good tidings, or your, your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may also testify to them, that they... Uh, may also come to this, uh, uh, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one of them rise from the dead. Now again, I'm not sure this is intended to be a parable as much as it might be a real a real actual account that Jesus is recounting for them in order to teach us a number of lessons. So there are some insights here that I think we'll find in these words. Now again, the context in which this account is told remains focused on the idea of stewardship, and in particular, poor stewardship. Another rich man who has much, he has the means to help somebody and really doesn't, just allows nothing more than the crumbs from his table at best to be what this man eats, if anything. Uh, he's outside the gate, the dogs are with him, and he's, in essence, scratching for food with the dogs. Um, now, in verses 19 through 21, let me bring up this point first. God sees the true nature and condition of every man. Okay? God sees the true condition and nature of every man. Um, Lazarus was poor, he was living outside of this rich man's house, the rich man had plenty, he was comfortable, he was happy, he was well fed, he lived in luxury and in wealth. Two different people, and I'll point out that the rich man did not go to the section of Hades because he was rich, any more than Lazarus went to the other part simply because he was poor. This is not a question of being saved or lost based on whether you have much or you have little. Please don't make that mistake. Uh, it's not a question of whether or not you have wealth. It's a question of whether or not wealth has you. So the rich man and the, and, and the poor beggar, 
But notice this. God sees Lazarus' suffering. He recognizes that this is a man who has nothing and is poor, is impoverished, is hungry, and is suffering. God sees the condition of this person. No one's sufferings ever take place out of the purview of God. God sees it all the time, and it never escapes his notice. I would even suggest this. For those who do endure suffering like we're reading about here, that only makes you know, the, the, the dry, parched nature of that suffering only makes that first cool draft of the living water of heaven all the sweeter and more refreshing. God sees it. And just because this is how it is now doesn't mean that God doesn't see it. There's, a, there's something that comes in the end for those who believe in him and ultimately have to deal with suffering in this life. God recognizes it. He sees it. You remember there's a, another parable Jesus told in Matthew 25 about the sheep and the goats, those on his right hand, those on his left. Those on his right hand, he commended and he blessed because when he was sick or he was hungry or he was in prison or he was destitute, they saw and they did something for him. They helped him out. And they said, well, when did we ever see you in this condition or in these places? How did, I don't remember ever seeing you there. And they said, well, as often as you did it to the least of my brethren, you've done it to me. In other words, he was intimately acquainted with their sufferings, and Jesus counted it as a, as a gift to him when you took care of them. By contrast, those who had the resources and ability to help uh, on his left hand but did not help, he says, you know, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was destitute, you didn't do anything for me. And they said, well, we never saw you. When did we ever see you? Thinking, no doubt, if we'd known it was you, we would have done something. Well, Jesus said, as, as, as often as you did not do this to the least of my brother, you also forsook me. Therefore, go and enter into that place of torment. Jesus is intimately acquainted with the condition and nature of every man. He sees. He sees, but he also knows and he's well aware. Secondly, let me point this out. There is an indifference that often flows from the hearts of those who have much toward other people and sometimes even toward the Lord. This man who calls Abraham Father Abraham had the means to do something for this God, but never did. His actions or inaction were an expression of where his heart truly lied, and that is why he finds himself where he does. We presume that Lazarus' heart was right with God because he's there at a place of uh, Abraham's bosom. He's there at this place of peace, this place of paradise. But beware lest apathy fall upon your heart or come out of your heart because of what you have and what you possess. Sometimes we think, you know, I wonder if the disciples hearing this story weren't shocked that the rich man ended up where he did. You remember there's another instance where Jesus speaks about to, to the rich young ruler who walks away sorrowful because he had many possessions. And Jesus said it is harder for a rich man to enter, uh, uh, it's, it's easier for a rich man to enter, uh, to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven or for a, uh, oh goodness, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that's, you know, some people would try to say, well, that, that word there for eye of a needle is a little door that was next to the big gate and you could never get a camel through there that had a lot of stuff. No, the word is rapim. It's, it's a sewing needle, okay? It's, 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 in other words, it's impossible, Jesus is saying. And he says so. Because when he says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man in the kingdom of heaven, and they say, oh my goodness, well then who can be saved? <clears throat> Why did they say that? Because in their minds, wealth was a symbol of God's blessing upon your life. Let me tell you something. Wealth is not necessarily a blessing. It can be. But it is not necessarily. Why? Because it has the potential to blind us to our need for God and to the needs of others around us. Because we live in contentment and we forget the fact that God is, you know, Jesus actually makes himself well acquainted with those who suffer. And if we don't, we are missing his heart. Sometimes this can happen to us. Again, it's not a question of whether you have wealth. It's a question of whether or not that wealth has become something more than a resource to you. And so beware of that indifference. Notice again verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. While death comes for every man, death is not the end for any man. Okay? Death comes to everyone, but it's not the end for anyone. Okay, there is something after the grave. As a matter of fact, this becomes a struggle for a lot of people uh, when it comes to 
disbelief. Because as it's been said, you may have been, if you ever listen to Robbie Zacharias, you've heard him quote this many times, but I forget which philosopher it was, but it said, death is philosophy's only problem. You know, for all the figuring out of the world and morality and all this kind of stuff, death ultimately is the one question that remains unanswered and therefore it gives us pause in regards to our own understanding of morality and everything else. Death comes to every man, but it's not the end for any man. There is a judgment that follows. As a matter of fact, the author of Hebrews says again, it is appointed for man to die once and then ultimately to face the judgment. You see, death is the great equalizer here. It's the point at which we all stand before God and we all have to give an account for what it is that we have done. Now, in both of these cases, both men died and there was a point at which they were not only present somewhere else, but they were conscious somewhere else. The rest of the story tells us quite a bit about what happens after we die. The rich man who was lost was in torment. He mentions flames. He is in, clearly in agony. He can recognize Abraham and Lazarus from afar. He is divided from them by a gulf that is uncrossable. He is wanting to save his brothers from the same fate, but is helpless to do anything. There's no analogy being given here. Jesus is giving an account of what is there waiting for those who are unbelieving. Now, Hades is not hell. Hades and death are thrown into hell after the last judgment. This is a waiting place. This is a holding tank, if you will. And there are two compartments to it. One is Abraham's bosom, it's called here, we're using that term, and then we've also got torments, the place where the rich man is. Abraham and Lazarus are on the one side, the rich man is on the other. Neither can cross to the other side. One of the questions is, do they both still exist? <coughs> the one does, 